Right, so temporality, wanting to address why the issue of time. If what we want to study is landscape, why is the issue of time and moral philosophy a part of your reading assignment? We're going to find out that for Meister, the very words we use when we speak about justice infer within them both spatial and temporal orders regarding the place, the place of belonging, kind of implied political status, and moral responsibility in time. And I think it's actually not hard to understand why that could be taken very seriously as an element of a cultural landscape. But with this, we are asking you to take a rather complex approach to the analysis of landscape such that uh, we've already heard from Long and even from the greater, um, the Grable River Sustainable Landscape Ecology Project, we've already heard about different temporal modes and being able to approach history, understanding that there are different modalities of time. So that's not so hard to understand. And if you think about the biosphere being impacted by humans, such that it gets embedded into the lithosphere of a buried artifact, for instance, or the charcoal of an old fire, then we know that landscape needs to be read for multiple modalities and layers of time. And Meister brings us to an examination of the question of justice in our time, justice in time, um, and that provides a rich study of the landscape. So I hope you're hearing some echoes and you can feel some threads from our previous readings that work well with this. Now I'm going to set my timer here. Oh, it needs to recognize me. My phone is so much smarter than I am. There we go. So I don't ramble too much. All right, here we go. The introduction establishes why the 20th century leaves Professor Meister concerned not only with the problem of evil, but the moral philosophy of after evil. So what if philosophy is taking itself seriously? What does it do after an evil has been perpetrated? He introduces us to uh, journalist Paul Berman as a spokesperson for the new human rights discourse. So we're talking about post-1989 human rights discourse. And that it was Berman who articulates the idea of the responsibility to protect, that there is now a world community that harmonically agrees that atrocious violence should be stopped and that powerful countries have a duty to cross national borders and save people, that supremely oppressed people have a right to be rescued from page four. Now, we all have been going through Syria since Meister wrote this book, and I think Syria would have been the example he might have used to identify this moment when you see people being supremely oppressed, and this question keeps coming up, should the United States be more active in stopping that atrocity? So this kind of question is very common and familiar to us, the idea that we would have a duty to cross those national borders. So he surmises on page six that this book is an effort to theorize the aftermath 
of the 20th century, my project has turned out to be about the temporal dimension of human rights. The pasts they bring to closure, right, that human rights has a desire to bring a past to a moment of reckoning, he's calling it closure, and the futures they foreclose. Because if you can have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission today, then you have set the path, and he's throughout this a little bit suspicious that those who benefited from apartheid, those who benefited from colonial conquest, really kind of like this reconciliation business because they foreclose that arrival of justice that would redistribute, take away the profit and the wealth and the territory from people who acquired it and exploited indigenous or slave labor. So, in contrast to the human rights discourse of Eleanor Roosevelt's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this new discourse, quote, presents itself as an ethical transcendence of the politics of revolution and counter-revolution that together produce the horrors of the 20th century, Nazism and Communism. So that that politics of revolution and counter-revolution, he's saying, is recognized as justifying violence that led to the totalitarian kinds of oppression of Nazism and Communism. And so human rights discourse gets articulates itself as the cure for the kind of thinking that led to the evils of the 20th century. So whereas human rights discourse, the Eleanor Roosevelt version used to be a call for revolution to politically promote human rights and equality, but now the human rights discourse is for intervention and rescue. So that's a different, um, we, we'd like to stop the oppression happening and rescue people to refugee camps, but we are not about reapportioning and reaturning the territory to them, for instance. So the old victim perpetrator or victim beneficiary dyad, those paired opposites, are recast as non-divisive ethical relations among surviving witnesses to human cruelty. So if we think about South Africa, I'm real familiar with that, and I'm assuming most of you know that at the end of apartheid, Archbishop Tutu helped lead that reconciliation effort such that you could bring in the perpetrators of apartheid brutality and the victims of that into the same room to bear witness to their common survivorship of the hell that that was. Right? So that now it's non-divisive. It's not victim and perp. The um, head of the apartheid government did not have to take the perp walk he, tur he took the, I will witness to my shortcomings walk. And from that, a kind of absolution, rather than the justice that says, for every finger that was taken off by you and your thugs, you will lose a finger. Right? So, doesn't want ret uh, that cycle of vengeance to be perpetrated. Um creates a moment of witness to, and his question, though, still troubles the air, um, is this a deferral of justice for the victims? So we didn't read chapter 2, but in chapter 3, I wanted to point out to you here that transitional justice is its own whole discourse right now. So this is the International Center for Transitional Justice. This is their web page, um, one of many such web pages. So he's addressing the fact that there's this whole proliferation out there of people working for transitional justice. And he helps us by going all the way back to Paul. He helps us understand that this question of something that happened with the sacrifice or death of a person um, and 
an intermittent time where justice does not seem to have arrived and that those early followers of Christ were quite ready for justice to arrive. After the sacrifice of the Messiah, they're ready for the second coming. And so with Paul, you end up with this demand of the faithful to wait for God's retributive justice. And um, Meister thinks that this story continues to exert a very strong echo in contemporary imaginings of transitional justice. So the old justice question might have been who does what to whom, for whom, and at whose expense, the police and prisoner robber for the, um, for the victim, and society pays the cost, that that kind of a justice, in transitional justice, the questions are concerned with temporality. What will have happened if the past is properly understood? So if you can bring W.D. de Klerk into the room with the woman who lost her husband, but whose hand was preserved in a jar because he was a writer, right? So she's living with the knowledge that that hand was part of the police force. They stored his hand in a jar to remember what they do to writers. If you could get de Klerk and her in the same room, what will have happened if the past is properly understood? If both of them witness to that suffering, the question then gets moved into this future, um, what would have happened had we known then what we now understand? Who would have stopped that violence? In order to think about the issues that Meister raises in Chapter 3, let's use me as an example. Oh, there we go. I'm still going to get through this. Of a beneficiary and use Grant Bulltail as an example of a relocated indigenous person. So, though I did not ever raise a gun in a massacre and massacre a group of American Indians, and though I did not lie during a treaty signing regarding what the treaty had accomplished, I have benefited from all those events due to my ancestry. I have title to a house with a view to Heart Mountain, while there is no view of Heart Mountain afforded to the Crow from the reservation. Hence, I am a beneficiary, while Grant, whose great-granduncle was buried on Heart Mountain, has suffered the loss of this inheritance from his people. So those notions of beneficiary, I just want to kind of give them that location here in this course and how we can take Meister's larger look at questions of moral philosophy and apply them to our own study of a landscape where the settler and the indigenous people then cohabiting with the legacy and politics of reservation policy and that's the edge we get to bring to Meister. We can ask those questions. And each of you coming from wherever you are in Wyoming or beyond will probably be able to ask a question about place yourself and bring it to him. Thanks.